he is just unloading on me about Christians, just like you're saying, stereotypes and this and that. And I remember praying, Lord, I got nothing. I mean, right. this this is a true story. He's not making this up. Right. But you know what came out of my mouth that I think was really helpful? And you know, the Holy Spirit knows best. This it didn't come from me. Trust me. It, he, I just remember saying to this young guy, you know, Jesus isn't like that, right? Well, welcome here to the True North Podcast. We are so excited today. We have Corey McKenna with us. He is the equipping evangelist, and I've gotten to know Corey over the last few years a little bit and so enjoyed our time together. So uh, yeah, welcome here, Corey. We're Chris, so glad a, that you could join us. It's a joy to be here, man. Together again. Awesome. Yeah, <laughs> it's been, <laughs> I mean, it's been crazy for the last couple of years to make connections work, but uh, I still remember the day that we met. I remember the presentation you gave. It was at a ministerial kind of thing we were at, and afterwards... To be honest, sometimes I tend to sleep through some of the presentations, but I remember saying that, man, that that's good stuff right there. We Appreciate need to that. hear more about that. I liked your delivery, your style, everything about it was, it kind of clicked for me. Thank so you. Well, I appreciate really that. So you go by the equipping evangelist. Is that right. probably the most accurate way to describe what you do right now? Yeah. And, uh, you know, a little, little sort of a backstory. Um, have you seen The Mandalorian? Absolutely. Do you like it? Absolutely. Okay. Is that okay to say on your, on your oh, show? For sure. Okay. My son and I watched all the way through season one and two, kind of well, dying to see the third season. it was sort of season. inspired by that. And so just kind of, a, kind of a quick sort of theological basis for this. There's, there's three uses of the word evangelist okay. in the New Testament. Two of those are what we would flag as the work of. Do the work of, of an evangelist, Paul says to Timothy. Right. Philip was doing that work, which is sharing the gospel with an unbeliever. But Ephesians 4 introduces sort of this leadership role that we would qualify as an equipping evangelist. It talks about pastors, teachers, and evangelists right. equipping the saints. We would say that's a discipleship role huh. in the in the local church to actually disciple saints to multiply gospel ministry. So what about the Mandalorian? Well, the idea of the <laughs> equipping evangelist doesn't mean I'm the best one or the only one. As a matter of fact, what it means is like the Mandalorian presupposes there's a bunch more. So I'm looking for right. them. And so what we do as a ministry is we train other equipping evangelists to train other equipping evangelists. So we multiply gospel ministry in and through the local church. That's the heartbeat of the, of the ministry. That's kind of a brilliant idea too. Instead of a one man show, if you think about the mul multiplication element of ministry, your potential reach is infinitely higher. If you can somehow manage to train disciplers, to train disciplers, to train disciplers. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I could certainly sow five gospel seeds on my own. I could right. talk with my mom or my dad or my brother or my sister or neighbors or whoever. Uh, but if I equip say 10 people to do the same thing, we right. multiply gospel gospel ministry right. through the local church. Yeah. And I think if we're being honest these days, that's, that's less and less common to have disciplers discipling. Like we tend to create a lot of converts. If we're being honest, like if we're willing to hold a mirror up to ourselves these days, maybe there was a time at which that was more the case. But in my time in ministry, we tend to make converts per se, but, but that transactional rate to the next stage where they start reaching out into their world it's a lot lower than we would hope these days, I would think. Yeah, so true, Chris. And I think that if the early church didn't have a disciple-making mentality, we wouldn't be here. Right. I don't want to oversimplify, no, but it's, no, true, it's true, right? I mean, it, I, I came under heavy conviction uh, as a new Christian that, wait a sec, I don't think the goal is to be, the goal is to make. Jesus said, go right. and be disciples. No, be disciples who make disciples is, right. is the commission. And so, yeah, absolutely true. We want to be disciple makers, not just disciples. And so, yeah, that's, that's a different level of commitment. It's first Corinthians, right. you know, before, before we rolled here, you prayed and uh, you talked about example and that that's really at the heart uh, of, uh, of my passion for the Lord is to be an example. Paul says, follow my example right. as I follow the example of Christ. Right. That's discipleship right. in a nutshell. And it, it also kind of underscores Jesus's model for ministry. If you think about it, instead of writing letters to his disciples elsewhere and kind of checking in on them every once in a while, he brought them along each and every day. And that whole idea of 24 hours a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, they were watching him absorbing by osmosis sometimes as much as by dictation and teaching, just so watching him live the life of God in yeah. the flesh. Yeah, it's so true. And that, that you think of what he did. He he had these these twelve. I mean, one was a dud, we Paul replaced him. <laughs> right? But but the, we had these twelve and he created this 
multiplicative movement yeah. through 12 men and he poured his and even at his three really yeah so he discipled those uh those men relationally yeah follow me i mean i will make you fishers of men yeah. and yeah absolutely i think it's so important that we have those relationships with those we're discipling and yeah. the authentic vulnerable all those words that in the west we kind of tend to to shy away from catchphrases at times mm. because we've overused them but there's yeah. a reason why they became so important to us as they're a good church. phrases yeah <laughs> and they're they're incarnational phrases i i keep coming back to this idea of incarnation uh, not just that jesus christ was the incarnation of god among us which we know but the fact that ministry itself at so many fundamental levels is incarnational. It's not just a, it's not just a transfer of information. It's a life lived that affects another life lived that affects another life lived. And, and I think the pandemic has taught a lot of us that is that technology is wonderful. We appreciate it, but human connection and the kind of discipleship that can happen between two human beings face to face mm. is impossible to replicate any other way. You're onto something, man. When, when John actually says, I have more to, to write to you, but these things must be said face to face. That yeah. actually in the Greek means mouth to mouth. It's very <laughs> intimate. I know we don't do that, but yeah, good thing we're a little bit distanced here. But really, it means it means that there are things so intimate and incarnational yeah. that we want to share one to the other that we have to do them in person, face to face. Absolutely true. And, yeah. So, Go ahead. No, good sorry. Point. No, that, that's, that's so, so true. And, uh, you know, I love to ask the question as it applies to, to disciple, uh, disciple making. You know, we, ha we do some gospel leadership training with, with church leaders okay. and, and, and folks like that. And you ask the question, how many seeds are in an apple? About seven seeds in an apple? How many apples are in a seed? Think about that. Right. And that's the right. multiplicative value of disciples being disciple yeah. makers. Absolutely. And I think that's what we're after. We're after the orchard, not just the apple. Uh, that's a good right. image, man. Yeah. That really is. And if you think about the underground church movements in history and around the world right now, they're not centralized through one public figure, through one large building. Like in China, the, mul the mass explosion of churches is happening just like that. It's like one apple drops, seeds, six, seven more trees, they drop and it continues. Totally Tens true. of millions coming totally from that. True. Totally okay, so true. Totally true. Major theological question for you. Yeah. Really, really important. If you're the Mandalorian, then who is Yoda? In your, <laughs> who's baby Yoda in your organization That's there? That's a good question. I haven't even thought about that. Let me let me get back to you on that. That's a good question. Yeah, Baby Yoda. What was, uh, Grogu? Yeah, Grogu. Grogu right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I need a Grogu, a mascot yes. for the cross current. Yeah, sure. someone to attract yeah. the, the generation that's watching. <laughs> So your history, tell me just a little bit about yourself, about how cross current came to be, and how you found yourself in what is kind of a unique position, like your equipping evangelist role, the kind of stuff that you do. There's not a lot of people out there doing what you do, which is part of what I think is so valuable. How did you get from where you were to where you are now? Yeah, so I was raised uh, religious, with, but no relationship with God. I was radically saved at 22 years of age, came to saving knowledge of Jesus, and uh, was a corporate guy. So I was, you know, I was doing corporate sales. Uh, God was very kind. He was he was blessing uh, the, the the fruit of my labors there. But I was called to ministry, and I was kind of a late bloomer, started school at 27 years of age, and mm -hmm. started pastoring almost right away. So I was just okay. a few years in, maybe five years in, pastoring a church, trying to be faithful, and uh, and someone asked me to, sh to, to equip them to share the gospel. And I remember thinking, I'm not super comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. I can do that with prayer. I can do that with fellowship. Yep. I can do that with worship and discipleship. But Equipping by example to share the gospel wasn't something I'd done at all. And the, th the terrible thought occurred to me that I'd been teaching and preaching that, but I just wasn't modeling that in my own walk, in my own witness. And mm -hmm. so the Lord just opened up a door for me to go to Southern California of all places, and I encountered what I would affectionately call a worshiping and witnessing church, whereby uh, there was a group of believers from literally all over the world and uh, majoring in the majors, the gospel front and center, and we were praying for folks and sharing this good news and, and equipping others to do so. But what I kind of got that was more than I kind of bargained for, Chris, is um, and kind of circling back when I was a kid, uh, and this will relate to your question, when I was a kid, uh, I, I did some research. I had this this huge affection for for tigers, white tigers. Okay. I tell this story a lot. On a gold leash or just yeah, white no, tigers? No, not necessarily, no. Uh, I had this this poster on my wall of a of a white tiger. And uh, so I'm, a young, I'm an older guy now. But when I was younger, pre-internet, I did s some basic research. What would it take to own a pet tiger? What could go wrong in Halifax, Nova right. Scotia? <laughs> Owning a pet tiger. But what I found out <laughs> was that what happens is the, the cub is removed from its mother immediately it's raised around your family and it generally grows up very domesticated very safe 
has no idea what it is. Its identity is lost in its surroundings. Right. In my experience, that was sort of me with evangelism. Mm. Uh, my identity as an ambassador for King Jesus was lost in my surroundings. And so when right. I went to Southern California, by God's grace, my first gospel outreach team leader was a man named Tony. Tony the Tiger, I call him. Because here's what happens. What I didn't say is if that tiger cub grows up, becomes a full-size tiger, if it sees another true tiger... Mm. It's God-given identity is unleashed, and now it becomes something entirely different. Right. It becomes what it was created to be. Right. I just needed to see a tiger. I'd never seen an evangelism tiger before. True sure enough. Now, side note, I would say we all need tigers in every discipline of the Christian life. Marriage tigers and yeah. you know work tigers and, and ministry tigers. And But I needed an evangelism tiger. And so God used the example of Tony the tiger to unleash in me that sort of ferocious effect of gospel witness and so the mission of the cross current i came back 07 started this equipping evangelism ministry called the cross current which is really at the heart of it all tigers training tigers training tigers to be an example to see an example and to help churches to normalize sharing the gospel that was 07 so it's been a little while but wow. that's the short story that's a cool story yeah. though I, I love that image if you really think about it there's a power there an untapped power that's been domesticated really that's been lost to comfort i don't know lost to maybe just not a lot of courage maybe lost to the pressures of society i don't know but could be a lot of things i think we're going to get into a little bit of yeah. why are people scared because we all have anxiety and fear associated with sharing our faith yeah. and you know i believe it's it's the one christian discipline that we definitively take a an intentional step outside the saved safe camp of believers into enemy territory. And that's not always going to feel fantastic. No, it wasn't. Whether that's the water cooler or whether that's the uh, downtown core. Yeah, it wasn't always pleasant when Paul did it, and uh, we shouldn't expect true. anything yeah. otherwise. Yeah, but I think there's ways that we can be warm and winsome about it, too. Yeah, well, absolutely. I'd love to talk about that as our conversation progresses today, so that's very cool. Yeah. One other interesting thing about you, I remember seeing, I saw a picture. Your hair hasn't always been the length that it is right now. No, I'm happy to have hair at my <laughs> age, but no, it used to be significantly longer. I was a singer in a hard rock band, and, uh, and uh, yeah, I was up to no good into my teen years, and God lifted me out of that miry bog and set my feet upon a rock and he gave me a new song and i'm very singing cool. it <laughs> very cool what yeah. uh, favorite band of all time wow favorite band of all time i mean i was a big bon jovi fan back, i know <laughs> are we I talking know. living on a prayer here wanted uh, dead well, or alive or I, I, what's I was our... a big fan so i like some of the kind of the the, the more cryptic stuff but okay. yeah i i would say probably you know wanted dead or alive and yeah. even the newer stuff but um but then circling back i, I liked journey a lot and it's oh, sort yeah. of singers bands you know i was a yeah. singer in a band and so i, I really uh, appreciate uh, but i like a variety of music but i appreciate uh, uh good singers and bands Fair enough. elvis is probably my favorite of all time Time, Interesting. I adopted his hairstyle, yeah. and here I am. Hey? He started it. Maybe, maybe there will be a wing of the cross current suit. It'll be rock and roll evangelism. That'll be wonderful. You'll, I'll let you yeah, know when that's do uh, it. Let's that'll do work it. around sure. here. Very cool. So let's talk just a little bit more about evangelism as an idea and as a practice within the church. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I thought was fascinating about what you do is you interview people on, or have at least at various places, interviewed people on the street, just kind of cold conversation with people, almost like Tonight Show, Jay Leno style, like questions that are meaningful, like like eternal kind of questions yeah. and get honest answers from people. Yep. So uh, one of the questions that I've been thinking about a lot as a pastor, as I lead a church and look at what's happening happening in the world in your time of having gospel conversations with people on the street cold call whatever it is what has changed about the people you encounter and their reaction to what you're saying over the last 15 or 20 whatever number of years you've been doing this what have you noticed has changed in that time period yeah that is a great great question chris i i think if we if we lean into the illustration of evangelism the gospel being like sowing seed so in our training we borrow that imagery it's biblical it's clear uh, I would say that there's definitely been a hardening mm. of the soil uh, due to probably inactivity. I don't want to be unkind, but I think mm -hmm. that if you if you don't allow your garden, or uh, not allow, if you don't intelligently cultivate your garden, there's a yeah. classic old book by, I think his last name's Alan, called As a Man Thinketh, a okay. little tiny book. And his sort of thesis statement is if we don't intelligently cultivate the gardens of our minds, weeds will naturally grow in there. It For takes sure. effort. Yeah. And I do believe that there's just been a, there's been an inactivity that has really caused 
the hardening of the soil of hearts in Canada. And so mm. I would say in a very short, I would say 10 years, yeah. we've it's seen been a rapid. very different culture in terms of response to the gospel, even fundamental knowledge of the Bible and the stories we all grew up with of Moses and yeah. the parting of the Red Sea. Very, very little knowledge of those fundamentals of the faith, yeah. even, I would say. And it's it's happened in, in a shockingly short period of time. I remember watching a some television commentator saying, if you grew up in 12th century France and you were to return somehow 200 years later, like 14th century France, very little had changed in like 200 years. Life was mm. relatively the same. You disappear here for five years and you barely recognize the culture and the technology that we're interacting with on a daily basis. Absolutely. We had friends that were missionaries. They went away for about 10 years to South America and they came back and it was, it was culture shock coming home. Right. It wasn't some pleasant kind of experience. It was culture shock coming home. So Mm -hmm. I'm kind of intrigued by your analogy. You're kind of riffing off the parable of the sower, right? Like that's kind of the idea that you're working with. When you say inactivity, are you thinking inactivity of the church? Or do you think inactivity of the average person these days, not willing to think through the hard things? Is this, was it a church thing that we have missed? Or is it more so that society as a whole has kind of decided we don't want to ask the big questions anymore? Yeah, wow. I think it's probably a mixture of both. That's the safe answer. But I do think yeah. if we look to Romans 1, I don't think things have changed much since Paul's thesis in Romans 1, that you know, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. Paul says some very hard things, yeah. but clearly we see the world is on a trajectory uh, because of the natural bent that man has. Jesus knew what was in man's heart, and obviously there's, it, it, it starts off bad and it continues in that way. Right. So I think there's that aspect that it seems like it is getting worse the world does seem to be getting worse. The trajectory, it just seems to be determined to run that path. But we're here to right. shine light into that. Right. We're, we're here to be salt. And I do think that um, if we were more actively, and I'm not just talking the pastor's job, I think right. we need a wholesale change of thinking right. that uh, the church is is supposed to be for believers. Should we be explanatory? Absolutely. Should we be inviting? Absolutely. Right. But church is really the, the equipping time for us to go. We, we gather together to go together. Yeah. And so I think if, if every single ambassador of Christ went with gospel in hand, uh, confident, um, faithful, had examples, and we were just having those conversations, even opening the Bible in public mm. is not something that happens much. So no. I've got this. Here's a little freebie. It's fun. Uh, I, I bring my Bible everywhere, and I mean the paper one. This is there's nothing wrong with this. No, fair enough. I'm with you on this. The paper, paper one. And I'll put it uh, you know, on the coffee table, if I'm at a, at a coffee right. shop, I'll put it in a, you know, if I'm at the airport, I'll re- open it up and read it. And you will have a lot of people re- react to that. Right. It's just not, not usual. No. I think if we just in, in that way, just conversationally, relationally, uh, introduced God and his word into mm-hmm. more common situations, I think we would have a different culture right over time but have that conversation i i think a, a metric i'm very comfortable with as it applies to results in gospel witness is conversations you and i can equip our, our, our church to have conversations have yeah. a conversation walk across the room one guy used to write that great great thesis walk across the room yeah. have that conversation you're taking your trash out have that conversation you know instead um, of measuring it on the final results and the response of the person which you have no control over and don't. neither did the best evangelists of all Absolutely time Absolutely true but you can control the number of times you at least open that door and allow someone to potentially walk through yeah and and in the context of of seed sowing Chris, what would it look like if Dresden Community Church was committed to viewing your Christmas Eve service? I mean, that is a great opportunity to invite someone. But what if that invitation was more about seed watering, not just seed sowing? Just to explain that. What if we equipped our saints to have a a cup of coffee with a family member or friend who doesn't know Jesus, Mm. share your gospel testimonial, answer some of these hard questions, or at least get back to them if you don't know the right. answers. Don't make them up, Christian, yeah. right? <laughs> you get ask your pastor. No, it's so true. Right? It's but so then, true. But then they come to the Christmas service having heard the gospel, Yeah. and your message can water the seed that's already been sown, but right. you can't water unsown seed. So I think we've been in this sort of holding pattern that church invitations are wonderful. Yeah. I'm not saying don't invite people to church. No. But what I am saying is how we can all be co-laborers in Christ, I think, is if we go and we sow and then we invite. 
That makes a lot of sense. I remember hearing like Billy Graham, obviously at least the most famous evangelist of the last century or so. For good I mean, reason. Yeah, for good reason. A man of <laughs> yeah. utter integrity, which mm-hmm. nowadays, oh man, do I respect that. Mm-hmm. When you see how many Christian leaders have failed to finish well, have fallen, like to see Billy Graham with the influence and the power that he would have exerted finish well, yep. to me is such an encouragement. But I remember people used to think that it was this, and I don't want to use the word magical in a negative sense, but it, as if you went to a Billy Graham rally, all of a sudden people would go from a zero acquaintance with biblical truth to a follower of Jesus in 90 minutes. But they did a study and they went back and they interviewed and checked in with everybody who made a decision for Christ on those nights and found out on average, there were 11 previous points of contact mm. before they ever made a decision to follow Jesus at a Billy Graham event. Yeah. There were 11 days different seeds, yep. 11 different waterings of conversations with a friend, invitations to church, something dropped off for someone to read. So it wasn't Billy Graham was doing the harvesting, but a lot of times he was already working with watered and planted seeds. So he was the one calling them across the finish line. That's a very interesting point, Chris. And I would say if we were to circle back and reevaluate current evangelistic results, I think there's probably a longer road than that. I hear 11 won't do it at this point yeah, in time. Because yeah. I think what we see, and we always use this illustration, it's not ours, but we borrowed it. Borrow this if it's, it's okay for you. Uh, you know, Acts chapter 2, Peter, Jewish audience. I mean, here's right. Peter, it's the day of Pentecost. He has a Jewish audience. And what that means is they have the knowledge and the worldview Right. To handle the gospel message. They've right? got they, boxes to put this you in. You got it. Yeah. it you know, they, they are able to understand. Peter basically preaches the sermon, the Messiah's come, right? You've killed him, repent. That's a hard message. Yeah. And it's sort of like a Romans road type message. I mean, you go to the southern states in the 50s and 60s, they right. had that foundation. It's right. sort of a Jewish type audience. They're just putting right. the pieces together. They've got the right pieces on the table. Let's just assemble them yeah. so they can see them clearly. Yeah. Well... My conversations at universities and colleges in Canada in 20, whatever we're in now, 2022, yeah. uh, are very, very different. I They're bet. more like Paul's ministry in Acts 17 to the Gentiles. Yeah. They didn't have that foundation. So what yeah. Paul does, Paul actually goes back to the beginning. Right. He Cre- has to tell the whole story. He grounds it in creation. He grounds it in creation. Yeah. And, uh, and if you actually look at the results, Paul was a pretty decent preacher. I like Paul. He's yeah. a good guy. Yeah. Uh, it says actually that that a bunch of them just rejected Paul altogether. Right. Uh, it says that some reflected, we need to hear more. Right. That's probably a common response with my family and friends. And yeah. But only a few re- repented and followed. Right. I mean, should we expect different results than that? Uh, I don't think so. Mm. It just, it really is a, uh, a, a more Gentile Greek thinking culture. So I think we have to be patient with the process if I can say it that way. And these people who haven't heard aren't starting on the 50-yard line. They're back at the one-yard line, right? Like your average 1950s Southern U.S. kind of person was already at the 50-yard line. They had a working knowledge of sin. They had a sense of the idea that there's probably a God out there, even if I don't want to follow him. They had a sense of what the word salvation meant, what mm-hmm. the cross was about. And and all you had to do, I remember Tim Keller once saying, all you had to do back in the day was connect the dots. Just right. like we were talking about here. All you had to do was connect the dots. And many of them already felt this like indwelling desire that they knew that they had a wrong part of their life, sin. They knew something was wrong and they wanted someone to take that pain, that guilt, that, that imperfection away. Mm. Nowadays though, I don't get that sense, like that people have any of those building blocks, like just like you said. To, yeah, illustratively, I often say, you know, what I used to do when I was a new Christian, and I was well intentioned, I was passionate. Uh, zeal without knowledge is not a great thing, scripturally, though. <laughs> and so, what I would do is I would take the centerpiece, picture a jigsaw puzzle, the centerpiece of Christ and the cross, and I would start to show it to all the people uh, in my life who didn't know Jesus. Right. And I would say, isn't this beautiful? And I'd do my best to. To, to describe it and esteem it. And I was sincere and, and I was just trying to do my best. But what they lacked was the the, the box the cover with yeah. the whole picture. Yeah. But it's kind of worse than that now because at least in Billy Graham's time and place, generally they had the right pieces on the table and you just had to show them the picture. Now right. they've got the wrong pieces. Yeah, wrong assumptions. I mean, oh my goodness. The, just everything is, is, is opposite at this point. So we really have to show them the whole picture place the centerpiece, but I think that necessitates dealing with the wrong pieces they have as well, right. which can get a little bit tricky. We have to be careful. The Lord's servant, 2 Timothy 2 says, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, right. kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting with what? With gentleness. Oy. 
I know. Hey? I mean, if you look at if you look at the if you there's a difference between the cultural representation of a Christian in 2022 and your average Christian. Mm-hmm. I get really annoyed when I watch certain news outlets, even CNN. Let's pick on one that everybody knows. I feel like when they get a Christian on there, they find the wildest one they can get their hands sure. on. They wind them up and yeah. then they give them a microphone That's and true. try and capture That's the shortest true. sound, but that they have. Yeah. And so, so often I feel like I'm watching going like, they don't speak for me. They don't speak for us. And right. it's a frustration. So I, I think there's a lot of caricatures, right? Mm. Like that idea of an exaggerated feature of the Christian world, the Christian life, the Christian belief system that's floating around out there. And one of those is anger. Like when Mm. you talk about not being quarrelsome, this is not an excuse to avoid the tough issues. Like I get it. Like I I get both sides of this discussion. It's not an excuse to hide when you're called to stand. But I feel like that not quarrelsome, peaceful, gentle posture is really absent today in a lot of the discourse. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there's a practical reason maybe for that Chris maybe it's just people get pushed and pushed and pushed yeah. they don't have a voice in the public square they get yeah. frustrated and there's just that human response like that I'm pent up right. almost. but I think theologically I mean I have walked a lot of miles with a lot of fellow equipping evangelists wonderful men and women of God who I love dearly but I would say theologically on some level some of these equipping evangelists I think more closely identify with with an old testament old covenant prophet yeah. than maybe yeah. a new covenant new testament ambassador locust, very different ministry locust and honey in a in the middle of the desert kind of a mentality yeah. yeah and so i think if we if we just again follow that illustration you've got an old testament prophet they are addressing a group of people who have the oracles of god they've right. got the promise of the messiah it sounds a lot like acts chapter 2 is what it does right but then when we when we turn the pages into the new testament now we've got uh, the, 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 the nations now are hearing the good news and we've got people of every nation, tribe and tongue and, and, yeah. uh, and they don't have this base knowledge that you and I even have in the West. And I think it does. This is why Paul now uh, uses these sort of adjectives of, of gentleness and, and be reasonable, right. be warm and winsome. And, uh, yeah. I, th- I think we've got to, we've got to be careful to realize that it's not just what we say, it's how we say what we say. It's vital, man. I, you should almost repeat that because I feel like for those in the back, like this gets lost so often in our gospel conversations because right. Martin Luther used to say that at least it's attributed to him. You can fall off the horse on either side, right? Hmm. You can fall off the horse to the left, going too far one way. And then when you get back on, you overcompensate and you fall off the other side. Mm-hmm. And I feel like when it comes to evangelism and just the position of the church today, either they acquiesce and just conform to culture, right? Or just right. go so soft that you're no different than the world around you, mm-hmm. or they go so far on the other side of things that it becomes combative and angry and hostile instead of winsome and reasonable yeah. and the challenge is to ride right in the middle right and right. and i think that's a challenge for all of us and i think you put you put kind of a a fine point on that when you said oh, there's a lot of frustration out there and and i feel that too as a follower of jesus it's not hard to feel maligned and mistreated and i'm not talking like capital p persecution but it's, it's not hard to see ways in which there is not a mutual respect or a mutual tolerance for true. Christian ideas in the public sphere. Yeah, very true. So. And here we have our Lord. I mean, the, the law came through Moses. Grace and truth. Grace and truth. Right. A great little book, if you've never read Chris, is a, is a showstopper, and you can read it very quickly, is The Grace and Truth P- Paradox by... Oh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to hit me. And it's called The Grace and Truth Paradox. Okay. Uh, uh, amazing little book that brings those two concepts together mm. uh, in the uh, ministry of Jesus Christ. And that, that's, that's who we're following. So we're trying. We're trying. So let's talk Acts 17. You brought it up. It's, I think, one of the most beautiful examples of evangelism in the New Testament, just that idea in Mars Hill. And, and what, what, what blows me away is two things, and maybe we'll talk about both of them. The first is this. Uh, Paul starts with creation, right? Like he starts from the beginning. Mm-hmm. How do we... How do we emulate that if we're dealing with, and it's true because I routinely run into people that ask me, why do we have a cross-shaped thing at the top of our church building? Oh, wow. yeah, it's sure. honestly like we're, we're that far off of a, of a quote unquote Christian society or yeah. Christendom. They're like, who is, and what, who is this? What did Jesus do? This idea that they don't even know about the death and resurrection of Jesus. Right. How do you, in just a practical sense, when you're talking with somebody, how do you start to frame that picture if you don't necessarily start immediately with that moment in history that changed everything? That's how, a great. How do you frame that? Is a great picture? question, and I and I think it's interesting. And if we just back up the truck a little bit, Chris, um, Paul actually starts with the resurrection. I don't know if he was thinking of Peter's results. Maybe, okay. maybe you heard about this. Peter had a, a had I'm a great try it sermon, myself. right? Three th- the first mega church in Acts two. Like, let's try that, right? Pragmatically, this makes sense to me. And so he leads in with the resurrection, 
And uh, the response is, what does this babbler wish to right. say? That's not positive. So no. Paul gets serious pushback. Yeah. It's then that he resets his presentation and he starts uh, standing in the midst of the Areopagus. I perceive that in every way you're very religious. And then he gets into the unknown God and he says, the God who made the world and everything in it, creation yeah. to your point. So what's interesting in Paul's sort of three panel presentation, if I can say it that way, I mean, Paul is so warm and winsome. He's so persuasive. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot going on in how Paul ministers here. Um, we like to, we sort of have pulled from that in our training. Uh, Paul intimates three big questions. These are not new questions. These questions have been asked uh, since the beginning because they actually flow from every human heart. We right. are made in God's image. Right. And Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, God set eternity in the hearts of people. So we are eternal beings. We are imaging mm. God when we ask these big questions or at least think about them. So the questions we like to ask to basically uh, draw out the three panels of Paul's presentation is the first question is, where do we come from? Mm -hmm. So I, I ask this question all the time to people. It's so non-confrontational. Right. People already think about it. And, yeah. and I don't mean like Halifax or Dresden or London. I mean, originally, right. where did this whole thing start? Yeah. And it's amazing to hear people sort that out. Uh, you you may or not be surprised that the the most prevalent view I encounter these days is a, is a theistic sort of evolution or a God directs evolution. Really? That, yeah, because of DNA and you know genetic information and information science, most people have come to their wits end and said, "Well, yeah, it's really tricky to account for you know information and in books pre pre, pre it." it, it presupposes an author yeah right? intelligent but, design is, is exactly. a compelling argument yeah be he's in my uh, darwin's black box he started that whole thing maybe right. and so but it's really neat because that first question really does set the trajectory for the other two questions mm -hmm. because if you if you will at least admit in a creator god then now all right. of a sudden you can kind of nudge accountability into that conversation yeah. if or, that is true then correct what? it's a syllog it's syllogism right yeah and so that's the first thing, and Paul starts with that, but then he gets into, well, then uh, what's the meaning of life? Mm. He gets into, he quotes those Greek poets, right. Epimendus and Aratus, right? And in him we live and move in our being. It's the meaning of life. So it's a second great question to ask mm. is, what do you think we're here for? What's the meaning of life? We've actually got this little, uh, I'll certainly give you one of these. It's, um, it's a little... A little booklet that I, I give to uh, to friends, family, uh, folks we meet in the community, and uh, the the three big questions of life and death matters, and it's got a sub question to bring clarity to the to the main question: Where do we come from? Were yeah. we created, or did we evolve? And then it gives a biblical response: What's the meaning of life? Who or what are we truly living for? Hmm. That's the one that really, really stumps people because maybe they've never thought about it in those terms Not before. Not those terms. Yeah. And you know, ha thoughts of happiness always enter the um the picture, but then it's very interesting, Chris, because when when an unbeliever um a, when they when they when they prescribe something, that is to say, when they say they want something better or they want they want something more, yeah. it really does presuppose a standard of what should be. Right. So I'll often say to them, "So, what if what makes me happy?" is entirely different than what makes you happy. Is that okay? Right. And you can get some pretty extreme examples that they have issue with. Right. Right. And so what they're doing, they're imaging their creator because we all have common base desires. Yeah. We want good things. Yeah. Because we're human beings. Absolutely. We're made in God's image. But I love this one. And then the third part of Paul's presentation, what happens after we die? The sub question is, does my life affect my forever? It's a neat question. Yeah. And so... Your, your, uh, your question was, how do we sort of um, kind of introduce these concepts? I think uh, just asking good questions, yeah. sincerely listening. Can I say sincerely listening? Yeah. You mean not, not just, mulling not just over. thinking what I'm going to say Correct. next in response to what you have to say? Sincerely listen. There are some very intelligent people that I don't agree with. Right. That's not the issue. The issue no. isn't about belief. The issue is about truth. Yeah. Amen very different. That. It People is. People believe whatever they want to believe. Yeah. But the question is, is what I believe true? Yeah. That's the question. And and I found just some of the kind of areas that I've been called to teach in over the last while, this whole concept of truth is is not just under siege. It's almost been unmoored from from any real logical mm -hmm. definition of the word truth. Like this this phrase, my truth or your truth. Sure. 
it's just, it's just like a fly in the ointment for me. Like I can't, I, I kind of grate a little bit every time I hear it because that whole concept is really a, a dismembering and abuse of the idea of truth because one is an opinion and one is a statement that corresponds to reality, right? Absolutely. And you may have your own opinion, but you don't have your own reality. Mm -hmm. But when I talk to people about Christianity, this is one of the number one kind of pushbacks that I get mm. is that, okay, that might be true for you, but that's not true for me. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, that you might like uh, Rocky Road ice cream, but I don't like Rocky Road ice cream. I like vanilla or whatever. Like that might be your opinion, but that's not true for me. But they use the word truth. Mm -hmm. And it's impossible to have a version of truth that you live in and a version of truth that I live right. in. So. Uh, do you ever encounter that kind of like we often would put this under the umbrella of like postmodernism or whatever this idea of like post truth? Do you encounter that kind of resistance when oh, you're doing these conversations? All the time. I mean, absolutely. That th this is a lot of the things we're struggling with in culture right now is when I define and determine truth, uh, then it's kind of the uh, it's kind of the I get out of jail free card right, right now, right? And that that's a scary society. Like the the outcome of that can be very. And I think dicey. we're witnessing the tremors of it right we now. We really are. And so Jesus claimed to be the very essence and nature yeah, of truth. Amen. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And so I th I think one of the important things that we we need to just help people understand in conversation is with all of us, our actions speak louder than our words. People say things, but then they do something totally different. Right. And that's really, as, as Christians, that's called hypocrisy. I mean, Jesus had real issues with people who said one thing and did another. Yeah. You know, uh, Matthew chapter 7, judge not lest you be judged, that whole bit. Well, what the Pharisees were up to there, you know, the, the, the two-quote fallacy, the idea of me too. I'm accusing you of the very thing I'm guilty of. Right. And so obviously hypocrisy is something no one likes. And what's happening is people say one thing and do another. Right. And so what you'll find is people deny truth, but they look both ways before they cross the street. Right. Because they know they're living in a reality that they can't just change it their own way. Yeah. And so yeah. I, I think really what that involves is gently nudging into the conversation, real situations. You know, it's easy for us to talk intellectually, yeah. but until it comes to bear on the heart, people really yeah. don't care. Yeah. Like for example, uh, and I had kind of used this at some point in time, you may believe the earth is flat, but that doesn't make it any less round. And if we're both living on the same planet, we, we both can't be right. But you're right though, taking it outside of the realm of a confrontational argument and just saying, okay, show me here. Like in this situation, how would that possibly work itself out? Right. And, and I think it's just so important that, that we have a mindset at the outset, if that makes sense, that when we start a conversation about the Christian faith, so we sow the seed, yeah. to our former illustration, that we're, we're encouraging that person to realize that we're not expecting this seed to sprout immediately. Right. The man sows the seed, he sleeps, he knows not how that seed sprouts and grows. Right. This may take some time, so let's continue the conversation. I would love to get together with you for another cup of coffee. Maybe we can meet every month. Let's just talk about the world and how we're processing this. And, and I'll just share how I understand this as a Christian. And I'd yeah. love to hear how you understand this as a non-Christian. And let's actually converse about this because that gives us more opportunity to water the seed right. and water the seed. But if it's one and done, yeah. I think that undermines what we talked about previously, that yeah. there, there's, a, there's a process we have to be patient with. I don't think I thought about that before, and I really like this idea. So what you're saying, for one, one of the number one tools and skills that we need to evangelize in today's world is patience. Absolutely. Like, if it's true, it's going to take a whole bunch of times. Maybe we shouldn't try and do everything in a 16-minute conversation. Maybe, maybe it's okay to, just like you said, plant a seed, and then come back and water it next time and let God do the growing <laughs> in between. Now, as you say that, as two people time bound with social media right. and TikTok <laughs> and Instagram. Everything's getting shorter and shorter and shorter. 15 Let's just, second increments. Right. Yeah. Let's just say that that the modern era has not made us more patient. Fair enough. Less patient. And so that's just God. That's not God's economy. No. God, God will grow it when he's going to grow it. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, that's a great way of saying it. Patience. We need to be patient. And I heard you say too, just this principal idea of reciprocity, like you're not just coming there to take out the megaphone and, and shout at them. You're saying, this is what I believe. Tell me what you believe. So mm -hmm. that reciprocal kind of conversation bears fruit is what you're saying. It gives them a chance to tell you where they're at. Yeah. And I do think, I, I remember speaking with one man recently named Rob and Rob, I don't, I don't believe in Jesus. I don't believe what you believe. And to your point earlier, Chris, I think it's important that we, we, um, that we lay that foundation of truth. You can mm. believe whatever you want to believe. Right. No one's going to force you, right? But 
but people who don't believe in gravity don't float away. Right. Gravity's true or it isn't true. So right. what I'm actually suggesting to you is Jesus is the very essence and nature of truth. The Christian faith is true in all that it claims to to yeah. suggest. So, you know, when we when we course correct that and and I remember this Rob gentleman, very smart guy, he said, "Yeah, that makes sense. I guess I do want the truth." I mean, mm. uh, and people do want the truth. And it seems like they understand it in a physical reality, but the minute we switch over into spiritual, somehow they think we're talking about something ethereal and less real. Mm. But maybe taking away that that division there helps people see. It seems to me what Rob was kind of realizing in that conversation. So that's that's really interesting. I think we could learn a lot from that if we started to practice. Absolutely, that. and it was neat because I, I ended up saying to Rob that um, you know with the question three, what happens after we die? Some people will say, well, we we can't know that. And so I'll often say, well, look, we were both created special, unique, fearfully and wonderfully made by God. God exists outside of that, that time-bound state. He's eternal. So would you not believe that if he has all knowledge, he could, sh he could give us insight as to what happened next because right. he loves us. Yeah. And he actually said, okay, I mean, only God can open his eyes. But right. I, I think we have a reasonable, rational faith because it's grounded in truth yeah. as revealed in, in Scripture. In Revelation. Yeah. For yeah. Sure. yeah and absolutely. I love that three questions idea because sometimes I feel like evangelism has become so complicated for people. And mm -hmm. I don't know who, I don't know where that came from, but evangelism seems to be something that people are terrified to do and they find it complicated. And the number one thing that I get back from people is I won't be able to answer all their questions. But I think what I love about your strategy, this big three question strategy is simply it's so relational and it's so non-confrontational at first say hey you tell me where do you think we came from and how do we get there right and you can allow those questions just like jesus did to make a point he would use a question more often than he would use an exclamation mark right right and that i i feel like i could tell my congregation that and say just start with these three questions and see where it leads and i feel like they could actually do that yeah they could and it's fun because uh, if i've got a you know a coffee meeting with someone and i've told them i i don't bait and switch i say hey i'd love to sit down with you and just share how and why I became a Christian. Can we right. just have a cup? I'll buy you a cup of coffee. It's a really interesting story. And it is. If you've got a gory story, it's interesting. Yeah. Right. And what I'll often do is send ahead of time, hey, here's three questions just to sort of get you thinking a little bit okay. about the big picture. And uh, it's really fascinating because if they respond before your coffee meeting, I can remember uh, my wife's cousin who, who he was a profess professing atheist, very, very willing to get together with me, though. And I would say, if you're being salt and light, they'll want to get together. I mean, if they respect you. And he did. And I sent him those questions, and it was amazing, because when he sent back his responses, first of all, I was shocked by his responses. It really is like a portrait. I, I like Bob Ross, if you know Bob Ross. Yeah, absolutely. As painter. And so Bob Ross, in 30 minutes, would paint. he would take a, a blank white canvas and paint this beautiful yeah. painting. Those three questions paint their worldview right before your very eyes. It's very fascinating. Mm. And when I got together with this, this young man, uh, I kind of already knew where his yeah. sort of worldview was taking him. So I was able to, to bring some gentle course correction through my presentation of the gospel and of course my own story yeah. to involve him in the story. I mean, make no mistake, evangelism is about, in some sense, conversing with non-Christians to involve them in the true story of the Bible. Yeah, we want to connect them to this history. Yeah, absolutely. And um, and so it's very is very neat because these were they're very non-confrontational questions I love and that. um and he was he was very willing to give me his answers to those questions and part of i think what people need a small education on and not not uh, proudly is everyone has a worldview like i think there's some people that are floating around out there thinking that they're unmoored from any worldview i just believe whatever i want but everybody has some sort of worldview based on how they answer those three questions that's right and so when you have a worldview there are some honest questions that you have to be willing to ask of where you stand first right. It's not just the Christians that have to, you know, sit exactly. there on the witness yeah, stand. Totally true. But it's a really neat way of of having that conversation, and I, I really like that. Like I'm gonna, uh, yeah, I'm gonna use yeah. that. I think that's brilliant. And Chris, even folks that that would admit, okay, so I have answers to those questions. If you want to call that a worldview or a bias or whatever, yeah. fine. But what they probably haven't given much thought of is to how powerful those presuppositions of that worldview right. is for every decision they make in life. Right. They're not connecting their behavior with their belief. Wow. Yeah. A lot of Christians don't do this either. Let's be really blunt. No, you're, I was you're a right. pastor. You're a pastor. Yeah. So a lot of Christians don't give enough thought to how my belief should affect yeah. my behavior. That's yeah. called consistency. Yeah. But 
the reason they think how they think, the reason that they're very dismissive of social issues is because those social issues are grounded in a worldview. Right. They're presuppositions, they're biases. We all have them. Yeah, absolutely. We just hope that ours align with the truth of the Bible because that makes us wise and our yeah. house is wisely built. And yeah. when storms come, we stand because, not because we're great, but because God's word's true. That's very yeah. different. Yeah. Francis Schaeffer used to talk about this. Like he was a, he, he was an apologist in many regards for his time and just a brilliant thinker. And he used to talk about one of the goals was to take the roof off of other people's uh, ideas. So they'll have kind of competing ideas that don't make sense together, but they've put a roof over it to protect them from the consequences of it. And really gently through questions more than anything, you can help them see actually these two things are in conflict with one another. And maybe you hadn't realized that before. That's, so that, I've never, that's a great illustration. Yeah, I like Schaefer a lot. Now, what would be a win? Like, let's talk, like if you were to go into a conversation, you've done this more than most people. That's what I think is so neat. You've done this dozens, hundreds of times. What's a win for a conversation, a first conversation with someone when you ask these big three questions? What do you walk away and go, okay, maybe they didn't jump up and down and say, I'm coming to your church. What's a win? I would say a win is continued conversation. Okay, so another coffee. Yeah, coffee an day. open door. I mean, I can't say this strongly enough. We, we want to do our absolute biblical best to leave the door open. Mm. I mean, this is all about timing, and that's, that, right. that's all about the Lord's work and their hearts and all that stuff. Yeah. And so if the timing is not now, uh, I want to do everything I can to leave the door open because, Chris, if you and I, let's just say I'm a non-Christian and you take the time to sit down with me, you share your gospel story, I have some good questions, but I'm kind of disinterested, the timing's not now. Yeah. If you do everything you can to leave the door open, uh, to be very warm about it, humble about it, um, when crisis hits, and it will, because life's hard. Right. When questions come, and they will, because life's hard. Yeah. Who do you want me to think about talking with? You. The problem is if we don't that leave so that door sense. open, if we slam it shut, if we, in one heated moment, we, we yeah. just want to get our pound of flesh, that's just not the posture in the New Testament. The New no. Testament is, if we're convinced that only God draws people to salvation, if we're convinced faith comes from hearing the word, I think we want to keep them hearing the word, yeah. not stop them from hearing the word makes sense so, to me <laughs> yeah me too so over now sometimes that's really tricky yeah if you i've got relatives maybe you do too that are really aggressive and sort of a little bit of pit bullish yeah and but i i still want to do my best if i have to say hey no problem it, but i'll always end a conversation whether it's someone i do know or don't know if you ever have questions about this if you ever need prayer yeah. if you're no strings attached if you never come to believe in what I just I just said to you, I will still love you. That's important, and that's oh, true. It's critical. It's critical, right? And I think that gets to the second half of that Acts 17 idea is that Paul, the way he uses that statue to an unknown God, the way he winsomely, wisely, gently uses their own philosophers, their own phrases, their own common culture as a means by which he can kind of build a bridge. Mm. It's very, it's very relational. It's very wise. It's very, it's very kind of tactful and deft. And I, yeah. Yeah, I just think that that makes so much sense. So what you're saying is we need to be thinking as much about the person as the argument when we're having these discussions. Absolutely, yeah. We're, we're, we're winning souls, not arguments. That's yeah. the idea. Um, I, there was a pastor I used to listen to a while ago, and he used to say that you can write somebody right out the door. Mm -hmm. Just That's that so idea. True. You can be so right, but you can be so annoyingly right that they're going to walk right out the door Absolutely whether you true. are correct or not in that situation. And we know that it takes, it takes humility to come to saving faith, and so we don't want to beat people. Yeah. Because most people, we always do this illustration, maybe it'll come on camera in our training. If you put your hand up like this, if I push against you, you push back. Right. So I think what a lot of cr Christians want to do, because they see the, uh, you know, the, the the evil in society, and I see it too, and God sees it. We know that's true. But what a lot of Christians want to do is they want to they want to push yeah. at the outset against social issues. That, that's my introduction right. yeah. to this conversation, and I think people push back because yeah. I think that pride's involved. I think you're 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 pushing against their worldview. We just talked about that. Yeah. So, but if I lead in with something that's more of a handshake, something that we actually share in common. We call it common conversational ground. What are th some things we share in common? We share a lot in common. I can remember being um, in another town and uh, there was a young man that I encountered. I was training a large team to share the, the good news. And uh, this man, it was obvious, I won't pursue this too far, but it was obvious he had a different sexual orientation. Let's leave it at that. But he was very, he was a little bit 
kind of pushing back yeah. uh, at me even having a conversation. I remember saying to this, this young man, I said, can I share with you how we're more alike than we are different? And he, he mm. was like, what are you talking about? You're a right. Christian, I'm not. And I started to talk about other things we struggle with, other sins we have. Right. And his, his primary point of argument kind of disappeared into the conversation because he realized, well, wait a sec, if James 2.10 is true, if, if it, it's only like it takes one law, if I, if I violate God's law on one count, I'm guilty of the whole thing. Wow, then maybe this is more serious than I thought. Right. But we found common ground in that conversation, and he was—he actually ended up giving me his email address. It was very surprising, but mm -hmm. it was the common ground. And Paul finds common ground in these three questions. Why? Because we all have answers to those yeah. questions. Paul could have let in with a whole bunch of stuff. Right. He could have talked about his, you know, his was it Philippians three, his credentials as a Jew, and he right. could have made fun of these guys. And yeah, I mean, they didn't he have a ghost of his, a chance. His testimony about his miraculous encounter exactly. with Jesus, but he Didn't starts with the yeah the common ground the questions. The common ground questions. That's yeah. absolutely we're all created fascinating. By God, we all have or desire meaning in life. We're all going to die at some point. Yeah. And so I think people are already thinking about that. Conversational evangelism necessitates joining the conversation. Right. Right. In the name of Jesus, we join the conversation. It's already happening. Let's join it. Yeah. Right. And I mean, there's common ground relationally with so many people you think you're different than. Even you and I, we talked about music beforehand and our history and, and guitar and all sorts of stuff because there was a common ground that we shared that had nothing to do with anything else other than we lived in the same world. And at some point in time, our paths crossed into mutual interest. So Absolutely. there's ways to build those bridges in even non like religious or overtly biblical kind of text to build that relationship yeah. to give you an opportunity to share the gospel. Absolutely. And I think, Chris, a lot of folks maybe just need to be a little more prayerful that as those yeah. conversations unfold, yeah. God will often open up a door for us to sort of start in the natural and swing to the spiritual. Think of yeah. Jesus with the woman at the well. I mean, they're talking about water. Yeah. Right, I'm drinking water, but then he, he he sort of swings to living water. That's kind of how gospel conversations work. Right. We talk about something in the natural we all share in common, yep. water. But then with music, and I, I actually use music as a springboard a lot because I love For music. Sure. Everyone loves music. And, um, and, and it's so easy in conversation to start to say, well, you know what? At one point, my musical preferences really started to change because yeah. something significant happened in my life. Really yeah. what happened? And off we go. But, but I think a lot of Christians just need to to discern how the Lord and the, uh, the Holy Spirit's leading in those conversations to start to kind of just maybe just swing over to something a little more spiritual. Kind of right? steering the conversation, steering right? The conversation. God will give you these hooks to hang on. And yeah, to kind of steer sincerely so. Yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah, sincerely so. How do you, what does that look like for you? Just real quick, like when you're listening, you're, it's almost like you're having two conversations, it feels like sometimes when you're talking with some of you, you're also trying to listen to the Lord just a little bit. What mm. does that look like for you? How do you make space for yourself to hear what God is saying? Do you, does he give you like a strong kind of gut instinct or do you say little one sentence prayers? Like what's it like when you're in a conversation like that to listen to the Spirit at wow. the same time? I, I just find like if it's sort of a planned type of conversation, sometimes impromptu, you're at the grocery store and, right. and something funny happens or you're getting your hair cut and something funny happens. And um, But if it's a planned thing, I think just prayer is, is vital. One quick story that was quite an amazing story. This doesn't happen all the time. But uh, I remember praying uh, one night before we were doing some community outreach, and I was really locked and loaded in, in Luke 15. And, and uh, that's not super surprising for, um, for an evangelist. I mean, it's about lost stuff, right? Right. A sheep, a coin, a son. And so good. I got this sense from the Holy Spirit that there's someone specific that needs to hear the story of the prodigal son. It was really weird. That, yeah. That, it's not super typical, but I was in prayer. I was sincerely asking God to soften my heart. Mm. May I see things as you see them, mm -hmm. etc. And so I was, uh, I was out in the community, and I encountered this young man. Um, he was a real cool, cool kind of guy. And um, long story short is I shared the good news with him, and he takes his headphones off, and he says, you know what? God will never forgive me for what I've done. And he went on to talk about this crazy life he lived, where he, he was with a girl, had a, had a child with that girl, left that girl, was with another girl, had a child with that girl, left that girl. He was busted, broke. He was in the weeds. You see where this is going. Yeah. And I said to this guy, you're the guy. I Just like that. You're the guy. What do you mean I'm the guy? And I said, look, I don't want to freak you out, mm -hmm. but I was reading this story and the God of the universe apparently put you in my heart, man. And I turned my Bible around. I said, look, I know this is kind of weird. We're out in the city here, but he started to cry. It was really strange. And he just said, that's me. Wow. And so it was this moment of when, when the Spirit of God, I think of Philip and the Ethiopian, the Holy yeah. Spirit led him down that road. And the Holy Spirit orchestrated the whole divine encounter. The Holy Spirit took him away. Right. 
we don't give the spirit enough credit for his work. And that was all the no. spirit because yeah. scripture says it's so neat that the spirit took Philip away, but the Ethiopian went on his way rejoicing. So it wasn't Philip. It was the spirit. Absolutely. So I think if we're just being sensitive, we if we sincerely desire to have those conversations, I would just say, get ready because God will open up the doors. If you're praying about it and you're ready for it, if you're willing, the, yeah, when that you're comes. willing. Yeah, yeah, I always love it. I've heard before that we often talk about the book of Acts like it's the Acts of the Apostles, but it would be far better titled the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Amen. He is the hero. He is the great he evangelist sure of he the sure book is. of Acts. Yeah, so. it's so true. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of Absolutely. a neat way of thinking about it. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Let's talk stereotypes just for mm. a second here. Uh, I feel like, and maybe we'll see what you say too, but do you feel like there's a lot of stereotypes floating around out there about Christians these days? Absolutely. I mean, I, th I think social media has been good and bad. I think uh, yeah. sometimes, um, you know, the Christian presence on social media, unfortunately, most often the loudest voices aren't always the most loving voices. Right. The algorithm is just designed that way. Yeah, right? it really is. And we have to understand the God of the sage is blind to the minds of unbelievers. So there is a, there's a societal bent against Christians because Jesus said this would be this way. But, but I do find that some of that, unfortunately, if the shoe fits, right, if, if people are behaving that way, if they're treating people that way, if Christians are arguing with each other publicly, right. you and I don't do that. Let's have a, a coffee together. And yeah. there's things to discuss that are important and we can disagree. An in-house debate, in-house discussion. Debate, yeah. So I, I do think, yes, there, there, is, there are stereotypes and some of them are unfair and some of them I think we have to own and, and, yeah. and repent of. And so how do we overcome those in your conversations with people? Do you find it best to kind of call it out and name it? Do you find it just better to change, just to model yourself in a certain way? How do you overcome those obstacles and those stereotypes? Oh, oh my goodness. Yeah, it, it's, it's, this, this question, Chris, sort of connects to your last one about sort of sensing the Spirit's leading. I remember I was talking to this young man and a new friend, and, um, and I asked him these three very questions, and he, his face kind of fell and he started to express serious frustration with Christians and churches, and and he had a he had a he had a true story to tell. It was really disheartening, because uh, his father uh, was a pastor, and his father had done some things he shouldn't have done, but the church really turned on him, and it got ugly in the media. Yeah. And as he said that, I recognized him because I knew his dad. It was very interesting. He looked a lot like his father, and so he is just he is just unloading on me about Christians, just like you're saying, stereotypes and this and that. And I remember praying, Lord, I got nothing. I mean, right. this this is a true story. He's not making this up. Right. But you know what came out of my mouth that I think was really helpful? And you know, the Holy Spirit knows best. This it didn't come from me. Trust me. I just remember saying to this young guy, you know, Jesus isn't like that, right? Hmm. And he said, well, what do you mean? I said, wow, man, we, we mess it up. People mess it up. We're imperfect. Right. Jesus is not like that. And he actually says to me, his name is Caleb. He says, yeah, I'm hoping that's true. That's an interesting answer. And I it said, is. look, if I, if I were to give you a readable and reliable translation of the Bible, he was locked in a setting that it was sort of a, an older translation. He did, just didn't understand. Sure. Yeah. And that's a problem. And so if I were to give you a readable, reliable translation, and I was to bookmark it with a clear gospel presentation in the story of John, John's gospel, very close friend with Jesus, would you read it? He said, I would read that. Perfect. Yeah. Because I think the more la layers we as human beings put in between that person and Jesus himself, the more trouble we're going to get into. Yeah. Because like we're going to mess game. up. Yeah. Whether, whether it's terrible things that we see, you know, in the news or whether it's just, I forget an appointment or an email or, but Jesus isn't that way. He's perfect. I think we have to be much more intentional yeah. at, at getting people to the source of our joy, the source of our peace, the very essence and nature of what's true. I think you're hitting on one of the major objections that people have about Christianity today is they've seen so much brokenness, so much, I mean, the stuff that's in the headlines, the stuff that's happened in churches, they've just been burnt so badly right. that it's very hard for them to overcome that. But you're, you're kind of articulating a really wise way of responding to be like, yeah, we're, we're human beings. We're going to mess this up, but Jesus isn't like that. So point them to Jesus. Really, it sounds so Sunday schoolish, but that's just, that's profound in a situation like that to be like, yeah, everything you're saying might well be true, but Jesus isn't like that. And I love what you said, might well be true we don't know people right. make stuff up right we <laughs> yeah. get that but but if what you're saying is true 
I don't blame you a bit. That, yeah. That's a relational way to respond. If what you're yeah, saying is so true, true, I don't blame you a bit. Um, but Jesus isn't that way. And so, no, I would never deflect. I would never make excuses. I think we live in a culture where no one seems to take responsibility for their actions. We won't pursue that, but it's true. Yeah. Christians have to do better. We have yeah. to take responsibility yeah. because whether we like it or not, anyone who names the name is part of our family, we would believe, or yeah. maybe they're not, but that's not for us to decide. So right. we have to give account for why we are how we are. We should be a family. And that I think that's a family chat. I think what yeah. we want to do is pull together those who are Christians and say, guys, we got to do better. Yeah. Let's love one another in the body of Christ. If we love one another in worship of Christ, then we love our neighbor in witness of Christ. But we got to get this right. Yeah. And I think that our instinct in those situations often is not to give any ground, right? Like if somebody says, oh, the church burnt me or the church messed up this way, and you, you feel like you want to defend it because you love the church and you're part of the church. But the wisest response might well to be owning ex confession, right? How biblical is confession? Confess your sins to one another and pray that you might be healed. Like we need to just start modeling that authenticity that we're being accused of not offering instead mm -hmm. of digging our heels in. And kind of like you say, it's like a bridge that gets built. And when someone's radically authentic and honest, it changes the tone and the kind of the temperature of a conversation. Doesn't it? I mean, when you have someone you can be real with, your guard's down, right? Yeah. That's one of the things we teach in our training is, it sounds yeah. funny, but but I always keep a post-it at the front of my Bible, and we, we call it the post-it principle. And it kind of goes like this, is that if I'm sitting down with you, and I've had some history with you, you're a non-Christian, maybe you're a really smart guy, maybe I've misstepped in my faith before, maybe you've got, you know, you've got concerns that this is going to, killer relationship or whatever, I'll actually write down on a post-it a few funny little affirmations specific to you that before I articulate my gospel story, I will say to you, Chris, look, this might seem a little, little off the script here, but I've just jotted down just a couple little affirmations that we can agree on as friends that won't become issues in our relationship. Right. Because look, I understand you're a smart guy, and my first thing is, uh, is if you ask me a question I don't know the answer to, I'll get the answer. Is that yeah. cool? Great. Uh, this won't become an issue in our... I, if you're concerned, I'm concerned. Regardless of how this goes, we'll still be friends. Is that okay? Great. And what you'll find is when you put all your chips on the table, you're real, you're relational, you're not trying to be someone, you know, too smooth. Yeah. People, you'll see the them decompress because now they don't feel like they're being teed up. They don't right. feel like this is like a, a standoff. Though... In terms of worldview, there's obviously there's Jesus, and then there's you know, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. All the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. Yeah. The Lord made the, the heavens, so we know that there's no neutrality no. in the kingdom. But that, that but we we can demonstrate and model um, common ground. And, and just because to... just because your ideas are confrontational doesn't mean that you have to be. Absolutely, like yep. your posture means so much in that. That's that makes true. total sense. Yeah. So, kind of last question for you, at least yeah. for today. If people are watching, and this is, I would say, would represent the vast majority of people I know, they're nervous about evangelism, uh, they're fearful, uh, they're just not sure that they have what it takes to do this. Like, if you could in just a, a minute or two or a couple minutes, like, what would you say to them? Someone who's like, I just don't feel like I have what it takes to do this. I'm nervous. What would you say to them to encourage them and to give them kind of like a guiding mm. principle or idea? How would you encourage them if you just had a few minutes to do that? Yeah. The first thing I would say would be, I would be very thankful to God that he's given them the desire to share their faith. Right. I mean, that's fruit of the spirit. That's fruit of uh, salvation, that we have a desire to worship Jesus in this way. And so I'd say it that way because I believe that when witness is languishing, worship is lacking. Worship inspires witness. Worship inspires witness. So I think the reason we have a witness problem is because we have a worship problem. And so, um, so I would worship. I would thank God. I would be, I would be joyful about my faith. I would pray about this. I, I would, I would put on, put on your playlist of worship songs and thank God for Jesus. Thank God for yeah. salvation and, and, uh, and be a, a thankful, content Christian. Cause then we desire to share this with other people. I think we want to be uh, content and thankful in all things. Yeah. Um, but I also believe it's important to live every day in light of eternity. We just can't get around this fact that, you know, I was talking to this, to this one young man at, at Western recently, and you've probably read that poem called The Dash. You read that, The Dash. Very interesting. So I, I explained to this young guy to, to sort of reframe the question about the meaning of life and, mm -hmm. and what happens after we die. I said, you know, on a tombstone, there's a birth date, a dash, and then a, an end date. Right. What, what are you doing with your dash? Right. And that dash is pretty small. You know, if we were to take a tape measure and extend it to Sydney, Australia from 
from Dresden, Ontario, Canada, one millimeter wouldn't even represent the vapor of this life. So I think we've right. got to be careful that we're living for the Lord and we, we, we have a vision for that well done, good and faithful servant. Yeah. So there's a saying in evangelism that, uh, that life is most fruitfully lived in the big picture. I think we have to live in the big picture. We have, to, we have to desire for our family and friends to come to know Jesus. We have to desire the glory of God and, and, and uh, to give account and to hear those words well done and all those things. But I also think just pray, pray. And, yeah. But the last thing I would say, Chris, that's so important, it was for me, would be to find an example, to, to, to follow someone and to, um, to be discipled by someone who can equip by example in this area. That's what I needed. I need someone who could actually not just tell me what to do, yeah. but show me what to do. And so I think that's really important. And when we, we train equipping evangelists, we have three kind of bedrock principles. And it's abide always, persevere in prayer, example in everything. Abide always, yeah. persevere in prayer, an example and everything. As we abide in Christ, like he says, then we desire the things he desires. We, we, we have this relationship we want to share with other people. We're rightly motivated to share this good news with other people. Yeah. Uh, but we persevere in prayer. When we pray, our heart desires align with the Lord's. That's the way this works, right? Mm. Thy will be done becomes part of our mantra. And then example and everything. I think one way to get over evangelism is to have an example to to see a tiger in my previous illustration yeah. but to be a tiger that is to say wow as a dad i want my kids to see a faithful example of evangelism for yeah. other people it's not just about me it's about we so i think those yeah. are some of the things i would encourage folks to process and to pray through but to be in christian fellowship and hey let's all get together Yep. And work together in evangelism. This yeah. isn't a solo effort. Why Let's does, have fun with this. Why does it have to be a solitary Why does endeavor? it have to be a solo Yeah, no, thing. that's so true. Yeah. And I think that makes so much sense, too, to find somebody who does this well and just say, hey, could you teach me how to do this? Like, I just love that concept. Yeah. I think that's brilliant. Yeah. Very cool. Corey, this has been a fabulous conversation. I have learned a ton. I'm so glad we could continue this on. And uh, yeah, blessings on you and your ministry. What you're doing is so incredibly valuable and necessary for this world that we live in. So we appreciate you and the cross current and all you guys do. So thank you. We'll be praying for Dresden Community Church too and for your ministry here. Thank you. I appreciate it.